Welcome. I am Dan Ruchan. Today I'm joined with my friend Nick Crowder, who is an awesome real estate agent, the author of The Golden Handoff, How to Buy and Sell a Real Estate Agent's Business. And today, Nick and I are going to be talking about how you retire from this real estate sales business and how you do so in a manner to get paid. Because getting paid is a good thing after all those works of years and years and years of relationships that you've done. So welcome, Nick. How are you today, sir? I'm great, man. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you and, and all your fans out there that are listening to today. All right. So you've been uh, you've been around uh, around real estate for a while. You've been uh, since 2006 in the uh, Portland, Oregon market, and a little bit uh, more about Nick because uh, Nick and I are actually uh, relatively close friends. Uh, Nick loves to uh, golf, and he and I were having a conversation about two weeks ago. And he he loves to write, and I was sharing with him. Uh, he and I are both authors. I was sharing with him that I hate to write, and he says that. He loves to write. So, uh, you know, <laughs> we're a little bit different on that. Um, but I, I love the result of writing. Uh, so uh, he likes to read. He likes to talk. He still gets up early and um, he's excited. He's an excited person for life. So, Nick, hello, sir. Thank you so much, man. Uh, it's funny. I uh, I think I like the result of writing more than the process myself. But, uh, you know, it's uh, I say that, but I was working on a little short story this morning, so I guess I like it more than you. So <laughs> I like it. It's just I don't like having, you know, like writing and not having the results in the near future. You know, it's like it, I, there's a you know, it's like you want to see an outcome and, and that's a long outcome when you're writing a book. So so Nick, what, what caused you to get into real estate sales? I, like a lot of people, honestly, I didn't have a plan to get into real estate. I used to work in the music business and I knew I wanted to stop doing that. I didn't really have an idea what I was going to do next. So, you know, I had a degree in marketing and music, had worked for myself already. And what I recommend to other people is what I did. I, I asked my friends and family what they thought I would be good at and what I would enjoy. And this is in 2005. The real estate market was just red hot everywhere. And so I had a bunch of friends say, man, you're really good with people. You like to network. You're not afraid to start a conversation. You'd be great at real estate. And so I kind of just, I did an informational interview uh, at Keller Williams in 2005. And I was one of the very first people they hired to that market center in Portland. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but you know, it was a startup franchise at, in that market. And uh, you know, I thought, hey, this will be great. I'll work part-time, make 40, 50 grand a year, keep working on music, travel, control my schedule. Fast forward two weeks after I got my license, I'd already bought my first house. And I was working with friends on buying investment properties. And pretty soon, you know, the guitar was on the wall and I was working 14 hours a day and absolutely loving it. So it was a total surprise to me that I wanted to make it a career. It wasn't, a, you know, but it started out as like so many people, I see you laughing. Yeah, I want to have control oh, of my God, schedule yes. and be my own boss. And I mean, I laugh now, but um, I was just, that was me. I was totally that guy. And uh, Freedom I and money. With it. Freedom and money. That's what I want. Yeah. Freedom and money. So, Nick, so so you got in 2005, and by 2006, you had, you had um, done pretty well for yourself. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I was lucky. I had really good mentorship. I worked really hard. I didn't have a plan B, really. I, so I kind of, you know, I was out of money. I needed to make it work. And so I just worked really hard. I was terrified of going broke. Um, and so I just listened to everyone, tried not to reinvent the wheel, and I worked my ass off. And, uh you know, by the end of my first year, I I got licensed in March of 2006, and I think I did 90000 in commission in nine months. Oh, my goodness. And I was new to Portland, and I only knew five people that were like my girlfriend and her couple friends there. I, I knew no one outside of that going into it, and I didn't know anything about real estate going into it either. And so I was in a new city and a new business, and I just tried to work my butt off and... um Got into the Brian Buffini thing early, just really tried to network, ask for referrals, and and just put myself out there. And um, yeah, I mean, luckily I had a great CPA who told me to set up an S corp, and I thought he was just trying to make an extra grand on paperwork, and that ended up saving money my first year, which I didn't dream it would. And and you know, I I never, I honestly never dreamed I'd be in the position I'm in today when I started. Sure. Um, my my vision was really small when I started, and it's become very big now. And uh, did and you have so, a vision when you started? Did you have a vision? 
I mean, uh, the truth is like it, my vision was I want to make 40 grand a year because that was kind of the other job offers I have were making that kind of money working for a corporation full time at a desk, you know, and, and I thought, well, if I can do that and work for myself, I'd much rather do that. And uh, I think once I had my so I that December, I think I sold eight homes and made like $50,000 in one month. And I had never seen money like that in my life. And so I remember that. And, and, it, and this is totally true. And I think it's probably true for anyone that's done it. Once you've done it mm -hmm. once, you know, you can do it again. And then it's just like, how do I do that again? You know, because sure. yeah. at that level, there really isn't anything you could reasonably want to do in life that you're not able to afford. And that's a very uh, intoxicating feeling. And so, you know, I, I just kept pushing forward, um, started building a team you know, at that point I realized I, I was all solo hundred percent. I needed an assistant and then I had started hiring other agents and, and that kind of like set me off down the journey where eventually we had 12 people on the team and now I have my own brokerage and um, have done a lot more with real estate. But yeah, I didn't have that vision. I think, but I think after that moment, I think after that first December where no one does I'm anything gonna, in December. $50,000 a month, the vision was like, oh, goodness, there's something here. <laughs> yeah, the vision kind of hit me in the head really hard. And then I just, I was just really excited about repeating that and, and doing more. And, you know, I, I'm sure you've done it too, but I've since go on to do much more than that. And, but it was kind of built on that foundation and, and just really working a lot of hours. Yeah. What's the biggest, uh, and I want to get into your book here in a few minutes. But before I do that, I want to just learn a little, little, more, a little bit more about like your early days. What's the biggest challenge that you had in the beginning? Yeah, that's, you know, you had success at the beginning, right? Um, were there challenges? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I worked, I was working, you know, 14 hours a day. I was doing two or three or four open houses every weekend. Um, the first couple of years, my health got pretty bad. I was like, eating really poorly. I was like, uh, you know, I had like a, you know, basically a, a, a VIP card to McDonald's, uh, and, uh, a lot of sitting you're and driving around. VIP, yeah. You're not supposed to have a VIP card at McDonald's. Just... You don't want that. You don't <laughs> want to have that anywhere. Um, and so I didn't eat healthy. I was like stressed out. I was drinking a lot, you know, cause I had like almost no time off. Um, mm -hmm. So I think like recognizing that two years into the business that I couldn't sustain that pace and that lifestyle um, started to focus more on my health and balancing again. And I knew that I couldn't do it on my own. And so I think the hardest thing for me is I, I was very naturally good at real estate sales and I had really good mentorship. So by that point, I knew what I was doing as well as just being good at the, the skills that are make you good at any sales, um, you know, following up, showing up, asking for the sale. The, the basic stuff I was already comfortable with and I was pretty good at that where I really sucked was managing people and hiring and training. Um, I was terrible at it and I had to work really, really hard to get where I'm at. And I'm still, I, I'm, I, I kind of give myself a C plus B minus in that. Um, but you throw me back and just doing sales again. And I, I mean, I'm an A plus in that world. I'm super confident and comfortable and I still struggle with the leadership, management, training, recruiting. It's just very hard. It doesn't come naturally to me. So about five years ago, you 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 documented and you wrote uh, the book, The Golden Handoff, yeah. and that's you know it's it's a step by step guide of of how to buy and sell a real estate agent's business. Yeah. And so what before you tell us about that, like what caused you to want to write that book? What happened was in 2010. I started having, uh, there's always agents coming and going in this business, but in 2010, what started to happen is really, really good agents were getting out of the business because we were still going down. We had been going down for two or three years, depending on what market you're in. And we weren't going to go back up for another couple of years, but it just kind of felt like you were in a plane that was just crashing constantly. And a lot of people couldn't handle it emotionally and also financially. Um, you know, the market, when it's really good, people get bad habits. I think that people are probably getting really bad habits right now in real estate because everything has been going up and been easy to get financing and it hasn't taken as much skill as it does when things are difficult. Um, and so good agents started leaving the business and, and including people I knew and really respected. And I started asking them, you know, Hey, can I help your clients? You know, let me know if someone needs something, you know, I can take, they knew me, they knew I could take good care of it. But what I realized is that if you just, 
retire from real estate or change careers, you're not really engaging with people. And so they already know other agents and they go other places and um, they don't want to bother you um, because they know you have a new job or you're retired and they don't want to bug you. And as real estate agents, I think you kind of get deluded that you have this special connection. And, and even with clients that love you, sometimes they've got five other agents and sometimes the timing just is bad for you. Like, you know, the other agent has someone that wants to buy their house already. And so they just go the easy path um, or you're in, on vacation and they want to do it that weekend. And so they work with someone else. And so the only mm -hmm. way to really get value out of your book of business, if you're retiring, you have to have someone come in and do the work that you were doing, right? Someone has to show up every day, send out the newsletters, look for properties, go to the appointments, make the calls, do the follow-ups. And if you do that, then that whole tribe of clients, right? Let, let your sphere of influence, your database, your client list, whatever you call it, someone can adopt those people and do that work when you want to stop doing it and really maintain that cohesion, keep the tribe together, keep the database together and be the new point person and the new person doing the job of a realtor. And so what happened is I helped the first person do that and it was really successful. And our my business grew pretty dramatically. Um, my database grew by 300 people. Our sales grew pretty dramatically. Um, I helped another person who was retiring. I helped another person who was retiring. Now our database was about 500 people bigger. And you know, at the time it was probably a couple hundred, two, 300 maybe. And so all of a sudden my business has doubled and tripled and it's all referral, right? I'm not cold calling, I'm not buying leads. I'm not door knocking. I was still doing open houses, but not as many, you know, now I just had a list of people already. It was like that had already met me because I was endorsed by their agent. And, um, you know, I ended up helping about four people and, and I started, I started reaching out to other team leaders and managers in other markets to see if there was a model that other people were using that worked better than what I had made up. And the golden handoff is essentially a referral agreement, but instead of a referral for one person, it's for everyone. And that's, that's the secret because it isn't complicated and it's something we're all familiar with. The money part is, is pretty straightforward. You don't have to get a business valuation. It's just how many houses did you help someone buy or sell from that database? And then you get a referral fee. Um, and so I started asking around and no one had a model. No one could tell me how to do it better than what I was doing. And what started happening over and over again was, hey, that's a great idea. We need that. I don't know why we don't have it. If you've done this three or four times, you've probably done it more than anyone in the country. And if you've got a sure. model, yeah. you should share it. And people, we need the industry needs this. You should write a book. And then my ego said, "Well, that sounds easy. I'll just write a book and a you know I'll just take a week off. I'll write a book and and off we go." And you're laughing, Dan, because you and I have talked I'm about this. But <laughs> no matter how fast <laughs> you write that first draft, you have to edit it, and that takes a long time. Yeah. So if for me, it took another three years to back and forth with the editor because I'm still working in real estate. I'm trying to now have a balanced life. I'm training, I'm recruiting, I'm hiring, I'm managing, I'm still selling. And uh, so, it, you know, I, I, I ignored it and procrastinated just like anyone does. And, but we got it done. And I'm so proud that I did because I know it's helped so many people. You know, just before we got on, I got an email. Someone said, hey, thank you so much. I really appreciate you wrote this. It's helped me a lot. And I'm sure you get feedback like that. Um, where it, it's just kind of comes out of nowhere. And it just, it, it reminds you why you put in the work when no one was, no one knew you what you were doing, right? There's no feedback. There's no response. You're not on stage. There's no bestseller list yet. You're just sitting there alone. Retyping sentences. And <laughs> <laughs> so Nick, so I first heard of you, Nick, and uh, you know, uh, I'll share this with the viewers and the listeners from your book, from uh, the golden handoff. And Years later, I, uh, a mutual friend of, uh, of uh, Nick and mine, uh, Justin Stoddard, had uh, had a conversation with me. He said, hey, there's somebody you should meet. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I, I've used that book. I've, I've used that strategy. And so um, interesting enough, the way that we got connected several years after I bought your book and, and, and implemented it in my own personal sales business. And so that's about as big of an endorsement as I can give you because well before I met you, I had already, uh, you know, bought the book and, and used it, and um, you know, it's and I think it's a brilliant plan, and it, and it walks you step by step, like he for the retiring agent as well as the purchasing agent. Yeah, here's how here's the way that you approach this, and and, and here's the way that you could do this in a manner that uh, both benefits a win win. 
So I think it's brilliant. Cool, man. I appreciate that very much. And um, I'm glad we were able to connect because, you know, I'm always really excited to hear about how people are using it, uh, the book and the idea and how they're implementing it. Uh, it's been really interesting, the things I've learned in presenting it and, and hearing from people how they've taken the idea and adapted it to their situation. And um, you know this, but I'm working on a new chapter about partial handoffs and mergers because when I wrote the book, all the people I worked with were 100% done. They were retired. But what I'm seeing more and more, especially with top producers, is they don't just stop one day. Mm -hmm. They kind of they mm -hmm. slowly phase out. And if, so if you can kind of phase in while they're phasing out and work together for a couple of years or whatever that time frame looks like, I, you can have even higher levels of success because those clients get more and more familiar with the fact that you're working together and and that everyone gets comfortable who with with a new agent um, and the adopting agent and the retiring agent get to kind of share ideas and learn from each other. And so I, I think that's going to be the most common way it's done going forward. So I'm working on that. And as you mentioned, we finally did a workbook edition, which I've been promising forever. And it's it's literally uh, it. It has all of the checklists and steps, step by step, for the retiring agent and the adopting agent, and then the steps that I think you should do together. And uh, those are both on Amazon, and you can just go to goldenhandoff.com to get the direct links to those. And um, we also have a really great calculator that I built on the website that kind of shows you how much money you could possibly make by adopting someone's business, and how much money that retiring agent is going to make. That they're going to lose, you know, sometimes fifty, a hundred couple hundred thousand dollars if they don't do this because their clients are going to just go find a new agent and they're not going to not going to know if it's a good agent or a new agent or a bad agent or you know but you can definitely pick someone to take over you can you can pick your replacement and your clients are going to be so happy you didn't just retire and turn off your phone because people count on us you know people really count on good agents to help and guide them uh, through a, really big decisions there's a uh, there's a local agent in my marketplace who's a phenomenal local agent and they are in the third generation of their business. Not, wow. not like, not like mother daughter. And so my friend who's the agent was the second generation and now she's retiring. Uh, the first generation had unfortunately passed away. So, um, so there was like a transition from the first generation to the second and now she's transitioning it to the third generation which there's value. I mean, that's it's proof that it works when you approach it with a plan. It's not sure. going to work, you know, just you know, just you know, by winging it. Like, you know, when you approach it with a plan, there's value. If you're a retiring agent right now, you've been working and you want to phase down or you want to completely get out, uh, you know, you're leaving income on the table from those, you know, from all that work and all that relationship that you you put into it. Where yeah. you can do it in a, I love following systems. That's you know, I'm a, a, a consistent, predictable income, right? It's it's about following systems. It's about following a pathway. Everything has a system, and this is a system which is wanted to have you on here today, Nick. Of like, okay, at the end of your career, what's next? How do you continue yeah. to monetize? You know, the uh, the business that you built, and it's brilliant. So yeah, I, I kind of call it a, a win 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 because. I mean, the, the biggest winner is you could retire sooner sure. and with more money. If you don't need the money, it's money you could donate to charity or your church or your community, whatever whatever you want to do with it. Um, set up college funds for your kids and grandkids. Um, so, but it's a way to, to benefit from all the work you have put in and be able to retire sooner if that's one of your goals. The adopting agent gets to grow dramatically. I mean, you're growing exponentially. You're growing by referral. I think all of us would agree we want to work by referral, right? I mean... Oh yeah, yes. If every I mean, day I, someone called you, I'm, and I'm comfortable calling expired agents, expired listings, I'm comfortable with for sale by owners. I'm comfortable with all that, but guess what? It's a lot easier when somebody refers them to you. What? Yeah. I mean, when I say easy way, when you're referred, you don't have to sell yourself. You just show up and help the client, right? You you're already there with the endorsement of the person that referred you. They've already sold you before you show up. And so you don't spend all your time trying to convince someone to hire you. You spend your time talking about how to help that client either buy or sell or invest or figure out you know, their, what's the best path for them. And that's what I think most of us enjoy the most. It's always fun to get a new client, but if you could spend all day just helping people do what you're good at, that's a lot more fun than cold calling expireds or FISBOs or, or door knocking. 
Um, and again, I've done all that too. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but the reason people have done that is because, you know, you're going to get enough referrals for 10 or 20 deals, but you want to do 40, right? So you got to sure. go find those other, the other half your business somewhere else. You know, our business, our team, even today is about 75 to 80% repeat and referral. And it's just about staying in touch with your people. The third win in this is the clients, because what if you're the last person that buys a house with Dan, right? Dan, you sell him a house and then you turn I'm off sorry. your phone and I'm, you retire. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you get an you know, apology letter for me. <laughs> six months later, their their furnace needs servicing, and they're like, "Well, who do I call?" There's, you know, I don't want to just go to the phone book. We'll call Dan. I'm sure he knows a furnace guy. They call Dan's number, and his phone's disconnected. You know, that doesn't feel good. Um, you want to know you can count on someone in the future, and, and that's why people refer you is because you they can count on you and and trust that you're there for them. And so it doesn't have to be Dan. It could be your adopting agent, and yeah. you know, they call and say, "Hey, oh yeah, well, Jeff's." A, taken over and he's helping all our people and you know he'll get back to you with a roofing referral um it isn't just about helping buy buy and sell it's about referrals and about access to vendors it's about building community and and you know having your client one of my favorite things this is obviously pre-covid is helping connect my different clients with each other um there was a period there where it seemed like everyone moving to portland was coming from brooklyn new york and so I was helping reconnect all these people that were New York people that were all of a sudden in Portland and didn't know each other. And in my old neighborhood where I live, there was like five different couples that were all from New York that all, I connected all of them. They all became really great friends and they all ended up buying in the same neighborhood. That's and, uh, you know, I would go over to that's barbecues fun. and it's, it's all these clients that I had put together and they're like lifelong friends now. I love that part of it. And that's, that's a big, that's a big part of the fun part of this job is, you know, being a part of that community. Yeah, I think I, you know, as you as you speak about that, Nick, I think probably about eighty percent of my job is just being a resource, sure. not for clients, not for people that are doing a transaction today, just being a resource for you know for people that are I have relationship with past clients, uh, you know, networking um, uh, folks, etc., and being that connector. If somebody has a problem, you know, they know they can give me a call, and I'm going to have a connection for them. No matter what yeah. the problem is, you know, almost anything. And so um, I find that probably, yeah, probably about 80% of my time is actually spent doing that. And then about 20% of my time is intentionally, you know, focused on helping my, my clients, to, you know, solve a problem and, and achieve a goal. Um, it, but it's, it's more holistic than just a one-time transaction. Sure. You know, it's more purposeful than that. It's about through time being that resource. And, and it would be a disservice for me to just quit today, hang up the phone and, and never be available again. That would be a disservice, you know, to that book of business for sure. So what's the biggest challenge that you see agents that are doing a golden handoff? What is the biggest challenge that you see them have? I think that, you know, it's really important to take the time to go over the database together and try to fill in the blanks. If you're lucky, the retiring agent has a good database and it's got good notes. It really, it takes hardly any time at all to go over a list of a couple hundred people and kind of say, who are these folks? When I do that, the agents always think of people that are ready to do something that they had forgotten about. And so it helps me prioritize, you know, who should I call first that might need me right now? I think where the big hurdle is, is from the retiring agent standpoint is having a good database that's accurate and updated is kind of the one of the biggest hurdles. And I think that's a hurdle all agents have is is taking the time to maintain that. And yeah. I, you know, I'm guilty of that too. And and I talk about it. I've been preaching that for 15 years about keeping that because when I worked in the music business, one of the things was I had a database where I could get a hold of anyone I needed anywhere in the world um, in the music business, or I was one step away from being able to do that. Um, and that's where your power comes from in you when you're working in a, any kind of community type sales job. The second thing is for the adopting agents is really making sure you're budgeting the time to do the work that you're actually have the bandwidth to call everyone once or twice a year to invite extra people to your events, your classes, to make sure you're, you know, taking care of updating those folks, getting them the newsletters, you know, connecting on social media, whatever it is you're doing to stay in touch with your clients. You want to do the exact same thing with all these people. And the truth is, you know, there's a point where you have too many people and not enough time. Oh, and course, so then you yeah. either, you can automate a certain amount, but this probably happens to you, Dan. I always think it's really funny when I get the same exact email from six different lenders. That's like part of an email drip campaign. Oh, sure. Yeah. And they yeah, all show up the exactly same, the same. For the same broker, you, know, you get, you get a, a recruiting email from a broker 
with a different name on ABC Realty and you get five of them from different, you know, from five different branches. Yeah, absolutely. So there's certain things you can automate, but I don't think you want to rely on that completely. You still have to have that human connection. You have to have a yeah. conversation. You have to communicate. It's you got to have a two way a talk, you know, so whether that's texting or social media, um, you can only do so much broadcasting like you know broadcasting is sending the email broadcasting is doing a presentation broadcasting is sending a newsletter you have to make that connection there has to be a response um and the best way to do that is still in my mind is still having a conversation in person or on the phone and so if yeah. you're going to add if you have 300 clients and you're going to add 300 clients and double your business you, you got to book twice as much time to stay in touch and so you, you better be intentional about doing that and do not fall into that trap of Oh, I'm so busy. I don't have time to do my calls every day because I'm so busy. It's like, well, you're going to be not busy soon because <laughs> that's going to turn, you, you know, stay a, busy. <laughs> a month is going to turn into two months is going to turn to six months and a year. And then all of a sudden you haven't talked to some people for years. Yeah. And then don't be surprised when they've working with someone else because you haven't stayed in touch. And so that is the, the biggest hurdle is just making sure you don't bite off more than you can chew. And you just, you know, like you said, the system, if your system is to send the newsletter, make the calls, invite them to the party, do the classes, do a video. You better do that. And, and as yeah. you grow your, your, your client list, as you grow your business, you need to be able to, to, to do, manage your time even better. Yeah. And the classes in the, in my opinion, the classes in the events are sort of the key ingredient to the sauce because that allows for, first of all, it allows for you to have a reason to call them, to invite them. And sure. second, and it makes it an easy call. Okay, that's such an easy call to say, hey, Nick, I'm doing a, a class where I'm, I'm teaching young adults on how to be the very best versions of themselves. Well, my goodness, right? Like if you have a young adult in your life, who doesn't want to help their, their, their young adult, right? Um, and, you know, and even if you, you don't, oh, that's still an easy call for me to make. Uh, and then for those that attend the events and attend the classes, then you get that second, you know, you get that face to face there. And it's a, um, it's an easy way to get 50, a hundred, however many, you know, 20, 10, it doesn't really matter uh, where you can get one to many in the same room and be really effective and efficient. That's how you can, that's how you can scale to those larger numbers um, is, is, is to have those events in place. And, and I think that's a priority if you do intend to, to do more business. Would you agree uh, yeah, with that, I mean, Nick? Oh, hundred percent. I'm a big believer in, in education and, and classes. And, you know, you know, we do a class on investing. We do a class on kind of intro to commercial real estate. We do classes on buying, selling. You know, I, I do classes for other agents on building a database. Obviously, I teach the golden handoff. But yeah, I mean, it is the easiest call to make is, you know, do a class on like, hey, I'm going to do a market update on what happened last year and what's going to happen, what we think is going to happen this year. And we're going to bring in a great lender and a great um you know, title person and we're going to, you know, we're going to have a discussion and you can ask questions and we're going to talk about what happened last year and what's going to happen, what we think is going to happen in the future and, and how you can be prepared. And the cool thing about Zoom and these types of meetings is as much as I prefer to meet in person, it's a lot harder to, for everyone to schedule their day to like take time off, to go to your, your office, to sit there and, and go to the class, even if you're buying everyone lunch. And so what we found, and I think a lot of people are seeing this is you're able to do more events and more people are showing up and getting a, to attend yeah. because they don't have to travel. They don't have to worry about traffic. They don't have to worry about parking somewhere and which, which conference room am I going to? So in some ways, this is, it's a little bit of a silver lining that you can, if you were able to do, you know, four classes a year, you can do one every month now. Yeah. And then you always have an excuse to call people and touch base, which is just awesome. Yeah, I've got a, a, a gentleman that I coach who he's doing a, uh, a whiskey night every uh, every couple months. And, you know, you say, like, how can you do this virtually? Well, I mean, you, I got another friend that he does a uh, he does a poker night. You know, we, we all get online. He's a lender uh, and, and he invites me. And it's like, hey, it's a good reason. I like to play poker. Right. So let's get online. Let's play online poker. And there's programs out there. You can do that. It's pretty cool. Sure. A lot, of, a lot of different creative ways to make it easy today with the technology. So, Nick, so I, um, I want to ask you one more time. You, you mentioned your website uh, before, and it has that tool to be able to help uh, you value the the value of your business. Could you mention that to us one more time, please? Yeah, if you go to goldenhandoff.com, mm -hmm. you'll have access to the calculator where you you need to know just two things. You need to know how many repeat and referral closings per year. Right. So if you did, you know, 
50 closings and half of them are repeat and referral. That's 25 repeat and referral closings. And you need to know your average commission. That's it. If you know those two things, it'll basically use the math that I use in the book to show you how much business you could potentially have and how much you could make uh, as the adopting agent and also as the retiring agent. So it, it, it does the splits for you. And uh, it's, it's, we try to make it as simple as possible and it should be accurate. Um, again, there's variables, right? You've got how good is the database? How hard is the adopting agent working? And people forget this, but the market doesn't always go up. <laughs> so when there's a, a market that pulls back or in decline, you end up with people that are underwater that hold on and rent their places as opposed to selling. And you have people that decide to kind of hunker down a lot of times because uh, they don't necessarily want to sell. The only thing a down market is good for, for a lot of people is, is doing a move up purchase or buy an investment property. And then it's the Great. best thing in the world. Um, for every other time, it's it's a little scary. So, Well, fantastic. Thing. Guy, I thank you again for joining me today. And if you're uh, a lot of leaders, listen, a lot of leaders in the real estate business listen to this podcast and this show. And if you're one of those and you're looking for a phenomenal speaker, you should, uh, you should have a conversation with Nick Crowder. He, is, uh, he does a presentation that will just blow your mind away. And add a lot of value to your uh, to your brokerage and to the agents that you lead. So that's a little uh, free plug for you, Nick, that uh, I, I, I know that you are a very, very skilled speaker and, and provide a lot of value to others. Thanks so much, Dan. My pleasure. Thank you, Nick. God bless you. Give us a thumbs up by clicking the like button below. Don't forget to subscribe to...